Russell Hearn and welcome to another edition of Past, Present and Future, where we meet EMDR professionals in the UK and across the world to hear their personal stories of how EMDR has influenced their work. Today we speak to a lady who's been one of the pillars of EMDR UK for more years than she wishes to remember. She's a trainer, consultant's trainer and long-standing board member. It's Sandy Richmond. Hi, Sandy. Hi, Russ. <laughs> I guess we've got to go back to the start in 1994 when you attended that first training with Francine Shapiro, who sadly is no longer with us. W- what was the atmosphere like at that training? Was there a sense that this was something new and exciting? Well, it certainly was. I think uh, if I had to find some words that would describe uh, what people were feeling, these would be the words excitement, incredulity, but weird, a bit American. But (laughs) in those days, but, you know, very exciting. This was something that took trauma away. It didn't just help people to learn to live with the effects of trauma. And so, you know, everyone was very excited and very interested and a little bit skeptical, but it was a wonderful atmosphere. I just remember, though, thinking when they demonstrated, uh, or Francine demonstrated the bilateral stimulation, you know, hand taps or... uh, the eye movements, I thought, how on earth am I going to explain that to my clients with a straight face? But, you know, we did, didn't we? So <laughs> <laughs> so it, it, you said, you know, a bit weird, a bit American. What brought you to uh, attend that training? What, what was behind that? Um, I actually was part of a, I worked in a, a unit in north of uh, London together with John Spector. And at that time, Francine Shapiro had written up about, uh, this was about a year before that training, about EMDR for the treatment of trauma, and she'd kind of listed how to do it. And so there was a a chap in the unit that um, had PTSD, and so um, some EMDR, according to this article, was done with him, and actually it really alleviated his PTSD symptoms. So he became very interested and went over to the States for a, an EMDR training there because there were no trainings in the UK, and so did John Spector. And so he came back, and, you know, of course I happened to be in that unit, and so EMDR became very much a, a talking point uh, in the unit. And so John Spector was instrumental in bringing Francine Shapiro over first for the first uh, training. So I inevitably I was going to attend. <laughs> so you became a facilitator and you, you trained around Europe with Francine, which must have been an mm-hmm. amazing experience for you. What, what do you think you learned most from working so closely with her? You know, it was really a great privilege uh, uh, to spend time with her and with other founding members of what became the EMDR Europe community. Uh, you know, in those days, it was sort of very relaxed. We were uh, traveling around. And really, what would I say about her? She's just an incredible, great teacher, um, a huge intellect. But she also uh, is someone that I, you know, she had a great sense of humor. But the main thing that really uh, came through was her passion, really, about alleviating suffering and I would describe her as the most human of human beings and of course in time you know she became this figure that nobody you know everyone admired and nobody really had access to it was such a privilege really in those early days just to spend time going around to different countries uh, in Europe and facilitating at these trainings which she presented yeah Mm. So from from those early trainings that she was presenting, do you think EMDR has changed dramatically in that time? Or you, do you still think you're, it, we're, we're very close to the, the original trainings that she did? You know, um, I think it's quite sort of comforting for me, really, is that the the basic standard EMDR protocol that was taught in those days still is still taught now. And it holds good. It's robust. And uh, I think that there have been many, many adaptations, and these have been necessary depending on the client group that you're working with. But we still come back to that basic EMDR protocol. And so has EMDR evolved? Of course it has. But the basic standard protocol is still there, and it, it works. The, the, the adaptations, the, the, the changes, the building on, on that basic, the building blocks of EMDR continues to happen. And I think that's a good thing. To come back to your question, has it 
has it changed? Yes, of course, there have been changes. There have been many adaptations, but we still come back to that basic protocol. And that is quite comforting, really, that we know that works and uh, it provides a sort of good framework and basis for good, sound EMDR practice. Uh, there certainly are so many adaptations now and so many protocols and certainly talking to some people you get the sense that there's a there's an anxiety that I've got to know every single one of them but like you're saying there's there's one protocol and these adaptations Mm. are really enabling the one protocol to be accessed by more people yes and uh, I think that's you know I know there's these protocol books uh, with different protocols and everyone gets very anxious. Oh, have you got the protocol mm. for treating this and treating that with EMDR? And of course there is. There's one standard EMDR protocol, and we make adaptations for a particular population, and that kind of simplifies it, doesn't it? It's quite uh, you know reassuring, isn't it, that we come back to what is the basic protocol and that works but we make the adaptations as we go along but we don't need to know a thousand different protocols Uh, and I know that it makes a lot of clinicians quite anxious that they don't have all the protocols um, but uh, they do they have the standard basic (laughs) protocol (laughs) that's what you need (laughs) yeah so you said there was this sort of tightly knit group originally, um, you, John Spector and, and others that came together and you were part of organising that first UK and Ireland general meeting to establish yeah. the association. What, what was the reason behind that? Ah, well, you know, uh, initially there were a whole, uh, in the very early days after that first training, uh, um, there were some of us trained clinicians and we would meet sort of informally at John Spector's house actually uh, to talk about EMDR matters and then we kind of, you know, it evolved and we thought really we should be formalizing this and we should have a, an EMDR association. And so, but, you know, we formed this group and we kind of, it was quite quite funny actually, because we'd say, you know, the group would be there and we say, right, we need to have a chairman, you be the chairman. Okay, now we need a treasurer, you be the treasurer. So I, be, you know, I became the secretary. So it was just part of that group is that I my job really apart from many other things was to organize that uh, that first conference the first annual conference and the AGM so when I say I organize I mean I just sort of did the mechanics of organizing it but it was the whole little committee that uh, was involved in that and so we had the very first EMDR conference and we had the the first AGM, which was quite exciting. And so EMDR UK and Ireland, because it led, at first we just had the EMDR UK and then included Ireland in the association name. And uh, yeah, never looked back after that. (laughs) Do you think, um, you know, from those very early days starting association, you be treasurer, you be chair, has it grown in the way you expected? Or has it been a complete kind of surprise to you? It's certainly grown. Uh, I mean, uh, I don't know that we'd ever have thought there would be. I mean, I think currently we've got over 4,000 uh, members and we have something like about seven or 800 accredited practitioners. And I think in that sense, uh, EMDR, uh, the association, has been very successful. I think it's probably grown way beyond anything that we could manage as we did in those very early days. I think that, you know, there are a number of us uh, on the board and we contribute all our time, really, voluntarily, because we really, you know, believe uh, in EMDR and the association. But uh, I think that it actually is getting much bigger than we can sort of cope with at the moment and we need to be more formalized in managing it. But uh, yeah, no, I do think it's grown. I think we need to encourage more and more people, EMDR trained therapists to become members uh, of the association. And I think that's something that is important for each one of us to do is to really encourage others to be and make sure that the association is supplying and supporting our members in the way that they would want to be. Mm. And the accreditation system, of course, is something that the association is involved in and very important. Yeah. And I know you're you're very into that. You want to obviously maintain the, the standards as high as possible. Um, is there 
anything that we can do? Um, because I was just thinking lots of people train, not everyone joins the association, not everyone goes through the accreditation process. Is there anything that we can do to encourage people to do that? Or do we just have to accept that, you know, not everyone will? I don't think we should accept that it, not everyone will. I think it needs to be encouraged. I certainly think that uh, trainers need to encourage those they're training to join uh, the association. And in fact, I know that all the trainers certainly do that. But I think each one of us, uh, you know, EMDR consultants, EMDR practitioners, really have a duty to kind of encourage other EMDR trained therapists to become members of the association and uh, to uh, really expand upon the benefits really for such a, you know, to become part of a network, a support network, and also uh, to improve standards um, and, you know, being part of a, an association and a network of EMDR trained uh, therapists is very helpful in that respect. I think there are, you know, my sense is that a lot of people will, you know, may be employed in the NHS and they become trained and EMDR cannot see the point really of becoming association uh, members and working towards accreditation. But I think that's changing, by the way. I really do think that a number of uh, EMDR, the units in the NHS see the value of having their, you know, their staff members who trained in EMDR going through an accreditation process and, you know, in that sense, joining the association. And we need to enhance and, and encourage that viewpoint, yeah. So if if you think back through the many people that you've worked with over the years, is there anyone that any one client that's that's maybe inspired you to continue this journey, do you think? Gosh. <laughs> it's such a privilege, you know. I think you can probably talk about lots of clients where you've just seen them flourish and grow and they've had a and especially those clients who's had a history of huge amounts of abuse and really uh, just had uh, an inability to function on a day-to-day basis and uh, in you know in many ways just watching her really grow uh, and process some of the, those early kind of traumas but actually to come through it with a very different sense of herself. That was such a privilege for me to go through that journey with her. And it is a privilege as a, as a clinician to go on that journey with our clients. You know, I always say, I, mm. you know, it's a, it is a privilege for me because when we go on that road, you're driving and I'm navigating, but I'm, it's your road and I'm going with you. And as the road gets smoother, um, that's, you know, it's you doing the work and I'm just they're navigating and facilitating and uh it's wonderful to see that growth yeah i was wondering too with with all the stories that we hear do you think there's a chance with with doing the work that we do that that we're more prone to burnout or we're more prone to um yeah, struggling with the the kind of vicarious trauma that goes with the clients that we see yeah i mean i do think that's the case especially if you're working with very highly traumatized clients um i worked uh for 12 years i worked at the traumatic stress service uh which is a trauma service at the Maudsley. and i found as I, as time went by is that i started to feel because we saw these very complex clients that had really had the most horrific things happen to them and i started to feel like I was a trauma victim. I started having nightmares. I started feeling like, uh, you know, I was being tortured. And so I actually took uh, a six-month break from my employment. Um, And I think that uh, when I went back, I was much more careful about, you know, not seeing all my most complex clients one after the other. And I do think that we are. I don't think it's unique to EMDR, by the way. I do think that any Uh, kind of exposure therapy or, you know, where you're actually exposed to the most horrific traumas that, uh, you know, our clients have experienced and gone through, there's certainly a, there can be a danger of uh, of, uh, being traumatized ourselves. And I think we've just got to be quite careful in terms of how we pace ourselves if we're working in, uh, you know, with highly traumatized clients uh, in in an intense way. so I don't think it's unique to EMDR, though, Russ. I do think that, you know, 
I think if you're working with a highly traumatized clients, you are at risk of um, feeling traumatized yourself. And in that sense, because we are bearing witness as uh, EMDR therapists to that person's trauma, and we're not coming mm -hmm. along with agendas, we're not sort of directing their progress in many ways, uh, you know, possibly we are more liable to be traumatized because we're bearing witness to their experience uh, and we are guiding them through that trauma processing and in many ways uh, that can also be traumatizing for for the therapist mm. i always felt that you know we we just seemed in more close proximity with uh, with clients i mean the kind of um, ships in the night position it always seemed like we were we were really there and on that journey you said you know side by side in the car um, and for me, it feels like that sometimes that so you're really in that journey with them. Yeah, absolutely. And you do. And you can see every kind of nuance of, you know, nonverbal communication. And I think that in itself can, uh, you know, impact on one because you're not having a dialogue with the client. Um, but I also think that it's, you know, I think we've all learned really to, uh, you know, to know what we're capable of in any one time. And of course, all our own uh, backgrounds, you know, we don't all come into this uh, profession for nothing. <laughs> we've all got our own background. So I think that can come into it. But I do think that that sitting very close by kind of, you know, that whole intense uh, kind of um connection with the client at a non-verbal sense, you know, can also be very uh, um, uh, intimate. I think it's a very intimate therapy um, and also very healing, but it, it, you know, it also can have an impact on the therapist. Yeah. Okay. So we need to look after ourselves too. That's a, an important message. I was just thinking, uh, we, you talked before about the adaptations to the protocol and we were thinking how that makes um, EMGR more accessible uh, to many people. Uh, is there still work, work for us to do there so that we can make it more readily available to everyone? Well, I do. I mean, I'm, I'm like Francine Shapiro was really passionate about, you know, making EMDR available to those suffering in a worldwide sense. And I think, you know, that was her lifelong aim, really, to, to take EMDR to all parts of the globe and uh, to alleviate people's suffering. And I think that, you know, that's really... Uh, I think we should be all kind of guided by that goal of, of Francine Shapiro's. I think that, you know, EMDR needs to be made available to some of the people who most need it, who just don't, uh, aren't able to access that. In this country, I mean, of course, that would be making more EMDR therapy available on the NHS. And I think we need to make sure that we, you know, more and more uh, therapists are trained and we provide that therapy. But I do think that there are, you know, there are um, a number of groups. There's uh, TRN, the uh, Trauma Response Network, who also providing um, EMDR therapy. It's a charity that provide therapy to clients who need it uh, on a voluntary basis. And there's also a trauma aide who's involved in training therapists in other parts of the world to provide therapy, uh, EMDR therapy to traumatized groups and uh, socioeconomic deprived groups. Um, and I think those are all ways in which we could do that. I, you know, what I bear in mind really is we need to start with, with our children and our families because we know from the ACE study that uh, children who have been traumatized at early mm. developmental stages uh, and, you know, have experienced some of those adverse childhood experiences are likely to, you know, kind of have such an impact on their later life. And so that's really where we need to be, I think, providing more and more and more therapy to families, uh, you know, to uh, within CAM services and to, to children so that they get, you know, and, and you, Russ, know this, that EMDR is really such an effective treatment when we're working with children. So I think, you know, just thinking about how we can expand the use of EMDR with client groups, um, and really that is making sure that EMDR therapists, there are more and more of those, and we are avail make ourselves available really to those clients. And in the right services at the right time. Mm. I was just thinking when you were saying that, I know you've trained uh, all around the world. I was thinking, is EMDR truly transcultural? 
Does it just work for everyone, no matter what your background is? Yeah, well, that's an interesting question. I think that um, because EMDR is not so much a talking therapy and it really does process things that are held in this very somatic way, um, I do think it becomes a therapy that can be provided to all cultures. I think one's got to be very sensitive uh, to how you administer the protocol. But, um, you know, when I worked at the traumatic stress service, we saw a lot of, uh, you know, asylum seekers, uh, refugees from other countries, and we could use EMDR very, in fact, you know, there were many different treatments that were offered at that service, but EMDR was the one, you know, treatment that really seemed to be able to reach those uh, clients who'd been so severely traumatized, and we could use EMDR very effectively and the standard EMDR protocol. It didn't need to be adjusted in any way. Of course, being sensitive to cross-cultural issues, those have always got to be taken into account. But um, yeah, and I have. I've done trainings in a number of other countries, and EMDR is used very extensively with right across cultures. And I, I mean, I think the whole point is that we can do EMDR with uh, populations where there's high levels of shame. They don't have to say everything that's coming, they don't have to report everything that's coming up. You know, we can use the uh, versions of the blind to therapist protocol and we can still process in a way those traumas uh, and the, the, the huge amounts of shame and humiliation that certain communities are, have suffered without them having to say what it is that they're suffering. Or And I think that is universal. EMDR provides that ability to treat people that we wouldn't be able to do if we were using straightforward talking therapy. Yeah. Mm. Sandy, I was just thinking with all the things that we've spoken about and uh, your long association with the association, um, is there anything else that, that you still are aiming for? Have you got sort of steps that you want to achieve still? Well, you know that I'm uh, very involved in the consultants training. Mm, so training uh, consultants, really. Uh, I always tell those uh, folk who are coming to the training, you're our creme de la creme, because really uh, the important thing there is really to make sure that uh, we are uh, ensuring that EMDR is practiced at a very high standard. So really that I see that as, a, you know, it's a passion I have is really to really train um, our consultants in training uh, to provide good and sound supervision of the um, basic EMDR protocol, but also to have a knowledge of all kinds of these protocols that we talked about, um, but also to ensure that EMDR is practiced in a way that uh, to a standard that is standardized right across uh, the, the world, really. Um, and so that I'm passionate about that. It, it takes a lot of time. And uh, I do think that um, that's something I want to in encourage. But I'm also very concerned about really this whole idea of making EMDR, making EMDR more accessible to our members, um, making the association more accessible to the members, but also making EMDR more accessible to populations where they wouldn't necessarily uh, in in the formal structures that we have, be able to access EMDR training. So that's really, I'd like to put my energies into making EMDR much more accessible to underprivileged populations. Yeah. Sandy, it's been a pleasure to talk to you as always. Um, and just keep doing that amazing work. Anyone who's not done the consultants training, you're in for a delight there. <laughs> I wish someone had told me what was going to happen before I turned up. <laughs> uh, but I will remember it forever. Um, so it's been a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you, Sandy, and keep up the good work. Oh, thank you. Past, Present and Future is a Laura Beach production for EMDI UK.